And our last speaker today, uh, Mark Reinmakers, will speak about the niche, uh, the hen or the egg. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So um, what I will do is update you on the conceptual advance of the role of the niche in MDS. And then the organizers also gave me this title and question, um, hen or egg, that I will try to answer, or at least contribute to the answer in this talk. I do not have relevant disclosures for this talk. So as elucidated in the previous talks, we know that genetic and epigenetic events are critical to the pathogenesis of MDS. So Ulrich's talk, Stein Eric's talk have have recapitulated that. There is genetic events and that, that drives clonal evolution. At the same time, I think one of the questions that is still to be um, answered is why do all these mutations occur? And if they occur, why do they gain competitive advantage? And that's not so clear when you look at some of the common mutations like splice factor mutations or tattoo mutations that do not necessarily seem to have a competitive advantage intrinsically. So these are, I think, questions that need to be answered and that really um, asks for a comprehensive view on the bone marrow and MDS pathogenesis and the role of the microenvironment, which, at least in the postnatal bone, is, 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 is the, the bone structure itself. Now, there is many niches, there is distinct niches, um, but for this talk, I will mainly talk about mesenchymal niches that have been shown to be important for um, um, regulation of stem and progenitor cells. So this is data of some years ago now where we showed that if you specifically change in a mouse model mesenchymal cells in the bone marrow, you can actually drive alterations in hematopoietic cells that are reminiscent of human MDS and that actually um, gives rise to a clonal neoplasm, AML, that has non-random genetic abnormalities. So this really supports a model of, um, if you want, niche-driven uh, leukemogenesis. Sorry that you are, I'm having a stable view here. But you don't. So I wait for a second. Yeah, thank you. Um, and this has been recapitulated in several mouse models now, um, that if you change the microenvironment, you can actually induce um, um, neoplastic disease. Um, so this really raises questions, and, and I've summarized some of them, and will address them briefly in this talk. So is there indeed a necessary contribution of the microenvironment to MDS initiation and evolution? If so, what are the molecular determinants of such contributions? And how then do I see that these alterations contribute to MDS pathogenesis? Now, what we in the lab do is we use these monogenic bone marrow failure and leukemia predisposition syndromes to shed lights on this. And that's basically because you can model a monogenic disorder. And one of these disorders is Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. As you know, a, a syndrome characterized by bone abnormalities and blood abnormalities, in particular neutropenia, but also a very distinct predisposition for acute myeloid leukemia. And what we do in mouse models is try to deconstruct the pathogenesis. So knock out this causative gene, SBDS, in distinct compartments in the bone marrow either the mesenchymal environment, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, or endothelial cells. And what we found when we specifically deleted SBDS in mesenchymal cells is summarized here. This leads to activation of P53, and then an inflammatory profile, including overexpression of the damp S100, A8, and A9, that partially through TL4 signaling induces distinct abnormalities in stem and progenitor cells, um, hyperpolarization of mitochondria, ROS, and genotoxic stress, DNA damage, which is accompanied by cell cycle checkpoint activation. So here is a link between a, a, a human disease-relevant stromal abnormality and bone marrow failure. 
Now, is this relevant for human MDS? Um, this is showing in a cohort of low-risk MDS patients in niche cells expression of S108 and A9, and you can appreciate that there is a subset of these patients that overexpress S100 in their niche, and that's confirmed here at the protein level, where you can see that some patients have quite high expression of S100 in these endosteal niche cells. And important to emphasize that these low-risk MDS patients with this niche inflammatory profile were not discernible using our standard prognostic parameters, IPSS, IPSSR, Yet we did find that if you have this inf inflammation in the niche, you have a substantial higher chance of leukemic evolution um, at a sh much shorter interval. And that's then reflected in reduced EFS in these patients. Now this really converged this data with um, data from um, um, Sheng Wei's lab and um, Alan List's lab and also um, Ben Ebert's lab that point at a common role in MDS, where S108A9 um, drives through the NLRPA3 inflammasome, genotoxic damage, pyroptosis, and ROS. And it also indicates another, I think, um, relevant um, phenomenon, and that is that while S108A8A9 may be everywhere in the bone marrow in MDS patients, the localization may actually determine its, its effect on a phenotype. And I mean that if you have overexpression of S100 in a macrophage or erythroid island or erythroid niche, this may contribute to anemia, as been shown by uh, Rebecca Schneider in, in, in Ben's lab. And if you have overexpression in, in the mesenchymal stem cell niche, this may actually help drive genotoxicity and perhaps also clonal evolution, as I will show you later. Now, is S100 everything? Just a couple of slides to, to, to show you that that's clearly not the case. When we looked at the gene expression profile of niche cells, and these are cells that we directly isolated from the MDS marrow, so no um, um, expansion ex vivo, we show that they are distinct from normal bone marrow niche cells, and that this distinction is characterized by inflammation, among others. And here is just some of the inflammatory ligands that are highly overexpressed in MDS niche cells, and among them are some known negative regulators of hematopoiesis and erythropoiesis. Now, another interesting finding is if you look at this cohort, we did this in 45 low-risk MDS patients, that when you, um, com if you compare the niche profile of of patients that carry splice factor mutations and compare them to patients that have mutations in epigenetic regulators, that there is actually very common um, abnormality. So this inflammatory profile you can find regardless of the genetic phenotype. And I'll come back to that in my last slide. Now, what is the drivers of this inflammation? Um, one of them may be that um, there is NF-kappa-beta activation um, that was suggested by transcription analysis where we showed NF-kappa-beta activation in these niche cells. One of the associated genes, NFKBIA, which is upregulated if NF-kappa-beta is activated, was upregulated in many low-risk MDS patients in niche cells, and that's corroborated here by PP65 staining, where you can see that clearly NF-kappa-beta is activated in hematopoietic elements in the MDS marrow, but also in these uh, niche cells. And this is shown, showing the same thing, but now by immunohistochemistry. Now, is this relevant? So when you overexpress NF-kappa-beta in a relevant cell type, a mesenchymal cell that's done here, um, overexpressing IKK in upstream kinase, regulator of NF-kappa-beta, um, you activate NF-kappa-beta in the stroma. What you see is indeed overexpression of many of these inflammatory regulators, and in co-culture systems, this results in reduced numbers of stem and progenitor cells and also reduced colonies. So NF-kappa-beta may be an important common driver of this niche phenotype. Now, is it the chicken or the egg? The, the, the question that I, 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 I had to answer here. 
I don't know. I can, I can start saying that we have never been able to convince ourselves that there is mutations in niche cells in MDS. Doesn't mean that they're not there. We haven't found evidence for it. And what we did see initially when we compare these gene expression profiles of these cells that we directly take from the MDS marrow, and we compare them to expanded cells, niche cells from low-risk MDS patients, and here we used data from the elegant studies of Hindley Juf that what you see in these primary cells directly in the marrow is not fully recapitulated ex vivo. So many of the inflammatory genes are upregulated only in the tissue. And when you culture these cells, they are lost. And that's again reflected when you compare then expanded cells with primary cells in these signatures that show inflammation. So this suggests that clues from the marrow are important for these inflammatory alterations. Now, in vivo support for this has come from studies in our institute from Rebecca Schneider. She uses the 5Q model of MDS, where she, in a hematopoietic specific manner, knocks out in a haploinsufficient manner these key 5Q Q genes. And what she observed is that then you see upregulation of S100A8, A9 in these scar positive knee cells. This was also found in 5Q patients. And Rebecca confirmed what we also showed that here in the 5Q marrow, you see these niche cells that overexpress S100. Now, she went on to take cells from this mouse model, um, differentiate them into macrophages, and then co-culture with mesenchymal cells, and then showed that um, by doing that, you upregulate S100 in your mesenchymal cells. And similarly, when you overexpress S100 in these cells, this is conferred to the mesenchymal environment. Now, so in answer to this question, hen or, or, or egg, I think it depends on the clinical context. In a congenital bone marrow failure syndrome, like Noonan, like Schwachmann Diamond, you clearly have a hit in the mesenchymal cell that can drive these alterations. In MDS, I think it's different. It's more likely that there is a mutation in a hematopoietic cell that then changes the stroma in such a way that it starts contributing to disease pathogenesis. And also here, there is ample of mouse models um, that show that hematopoietic cells can induce alterations in the stroma. Now then coming towards the end, what does this all mean? How should we integrate this in a view of how the niche can contribute to clonal evolution and MDS pathogenesis? Um, one slide, preliminary observations, is that going back to S100, what we observed is if you add S100 to wild type cells um, by genotoxicity, you actually get apoptosis and reduce CFUC. When we took DMT3 deficient cells, this was less so. These cells appeared to be more resistant to this S100 stress. And, and similar things have been shown and are emerging that some of the mutations that we often see in MDS actually carry some resistance to inflammatory stress. So what may this mean? And this is my last slide, and I have to say this, I think still to at least some extent is, is uh, hypothetical. What may be the role of the environment in MDS? Well, maybe that you have these mutations that we all know. Um, these mutations may have common downstream effects, and one of them may be innate immune signaling, that that is enhanced. And again, there is emerging data on that, and there is a very interesting recent review from David Selman and Alan Listenblatt that highlight this. This may include NF-kappa-beta activation, S100 expression. Now, this now, this enhanced inflammatory profile signals to the stroma and may induce NF-kappa-beta or wind signaling that I didn't talk about or cellular senescence. These things are not mutually exclusive in the mesenchymal environment. And this leads to an inflammatory profile that creates a, a genotoxic environment. Now, depending on what niche we're talking about, this may affect different cells. But if you talk about the stem and progenitor cell niche, it may lead to functional repression, as we've shown in the example of S100. And this may lead or contribute to the bone marrow failure. At the same time, these 
these mutated cells may be relative resistant to that very same inflammatory stress. And that may contribute to their clonal selection in comparison to wild type progenitors. And in addition, this genotoxic environment may or may not contribute to additional um, genetic events that ultimately drive progression, as was highlighted by Ulrich. So this is a model and, and needs more work. I think it's exciting because it would really indicate that targeting this signaling may ultimately not only have prognostic significance, but also um, help prevent evolution of these clones in MDS. Now with that, I'll stop with thanking many people, um, specifically the um, students that did the work and um, Rebecca Schneider in our department, which which we have a, a wonderful collaboration. Um, thank you, happy to take your questions. Yes, please. Well, oh, now it is. Mark, great, great talk. Uh, thanks a lot. You know, I'll start with a question on your, on your intriguing model. So, so one of the um, questions that I have in my mind is, um, you know, the, the transformation, if you look at DNMT3A or TET2 or uh, mutated clones, they only develop an MDS, for instance, in less than 1% of cases. So, so if this is a general mechanism, so if these mutations really induce this inflammatory environment in the stroma, what in your mind, or, or if you could discuss this, why do you think it's such a low probability event if, if you know, the genotoxic environment is a general outcome of, of these early um, mutations? That's just something I, I, yeah. I can't stop thinking about and I don't have a yeah. good answer, so would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, so that, 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 that's a good question and I think a difficult answer. So one of the things that I think we, we don't really know yet is that these things, eventually when we diagnose an MDS patient, it's everywhere in the marrow. And it may be, among others, that this inflammation is contagious, but it starts somewhere in a very local topic environment that we don't yet have a grip on. And so it may be that a very local event that we are, with the current technology, are not able to, to image or or survey that there it all starts locally, and it could be in a single cell, a tattoo mutation or whatever, and that that is then the beginning of a spread that leads to a more global environment where these things are promoted. But um, I think it's um, yeah, clearly work is needed to really define that, and that's gonna be a, a tremendous challenge. Okay, so if no further questions, thanks a lot, Mark. This is the end. Of, this is the end of the session. Thanks a lot for all the speakers and for you. And uh, have a nice break. Thank you. <laughs>